Yuji decided to move the family to the United States so that the boy could receive the best treatment. In the process he spent nearly all his fortune that he had received from his grandfather. His hope was that he could get some higher education for his wife, find her a job, and put her in an independent position so that he could go on alone. This he did, finding her a job with the World Book Encyclopedia. By this time his fortune had run out, and he was fed up with being a public speaker first on behalf of the Theosophical Society and later as an independent platform orator, his marriage was finished, and he was losing interest in the struggle to be somebody in this world. By his early forties he was broke, alone, and all but forgotten by his friends and associates. He began wandering, first in New York City, then in London, where he was reduced to spending his days in the London library to escape the English winter cold, and giving Indian cooking lessons for a little money. Then on to Paris, where his wanderings continued. Of that period in his life Yuji was later to say, I was like a leaf blown about by a fickle wind, with neither past nor future, neither family nor career, nor any sort of spiritual fulfillment. I was slowly losing my willpower to do anything. I was not rejecting or renouncing the world, it was just drifting away from me and I was unable and unwilling to hold on to it. Broke and alone, he wandered to Geneva where he had left a few francs in an old account, enough possibly to get him by for a few days. Then that little money ran out, his rent became due, and he was left with nowhere to turn. He decided to go to the Indian consulate there in Geneva and ask to be repatriated to India. I had no money, no friends, and no will left. I thought that at least they can't turn me out of India. I am, after all, a citizen. Perhaps I can just sit under a banyan tree somewhere and maybe someone will feed me. So, at the age of 45, a complete failure in the eyes of the world, penniless and alone, he walked into the consulate and begged to be returned to his homeland. He had little choice. This was to be a turning point in his life. Yuji walked into the Indian consulate office in Geneva and began telling his sad story to the consul there. The more he talked, the more fascinated the consul became. Soon the whole office was in a hushed silence listening to his remarkable tale. A secretary translator in the office, Valentine de Curvin too, was listening intently. Already in her early sixties, she had much experience of the world, and took pity on the strange charismatic man. No one in the office knew what to do with him, so Valentine volunteered to put him up in her place for a few days until the consul could figure out something. Valentine, no stranger to adversity herself, sympathized with the wandering, destitute man, and soon offered him a home in Europe. She had a small inheritance and pension which was sufficient for them both. Yuji, loath to return to India and face his family, friends, and poor prospects, gratefully accepted the offer. The next four years 1963-67 were halcyon days for them. She left her job at the consulate and lived quietly with Yuji, moving with the weather to Italy, the south of France, Paris, and Switzerland. Later they began spending their winters in South India where things were relatively inexpensive and the weather more benign. During these years Yuji, as he later explained, did nothing. I slept, read the Time magazine, ate, and went for walks with Valentine or alone. That was all. He was in a sort of incubation period. His search had nearly come to an end. He never mentioned to Valentine the occult powers, spiritual experiences, and religious background which constituted so much of his life. They just lived simply and quietly as private migrating householders. They took to spending their summer months in the converted attic of a 400-year-old chalet in the charming Swiss village of Sonnen, in the Bernese Oberland. 
For some reason Jay Krishnamurthy decided to hold a series of talks and gatherings in a huge tent erected on the outskirts of the same little town. Religious seekers, yogis, philosophers, and intellectuals from both the East and the West began showing up in the small town to attend the Krishnamurthy talks, to give and take yoga instructions, and confer on matters spiritual and philosophical. U.G. and Valentine kept a respectful distance, not wishing to become part of the growing scene which began to resemble more and more a circus. In this environment U.G. approached his 49th birthday. The Kalmara Nadi, a famous and respected astrological record in Madras, had long ago predicted that U.G. would undergo a profound transformation on his 49th birthday. As the day approached, strange, unaccountable things began occurring to U.G. Something radical and utterly unexpected was about to happen to him.